It's a school of thought. It says each present moment is so new and so unpredictable. You shouldn't bring any preconceived notions from the past to apply to it. Any ideas, any conditions that you pick up from the past would obscure the, the newness of the present moment. So your duty as a meditator is to be just totally present to the raw data, and that somehow by being fully in into the raw data of the present moment, you know the proper response. It's something instinctive. But there are no rules. All bets are off, basically, as to what's going to be the appropriate, uh, the appropriate response for each present moment. That school of thought leaves you pretty high and dry. Throws you into the present moment without a lifesaver at all. Unfortunately, that's not how the Buddha taught. The Buddha said there is a regularity to the way things happen. That's how he introduces the topic of dependent core rising, is that this regularity of the Dharma. Now, he doesn't say that everything is predetermined from the past and that by knowing the past, you'll be able to predict what's going to happen in the present or on into the future. That's not his approach. He said, there is a regularity to the way things are shaped in your experience. And certain things tend to be the, the shaping factors. In one analysis of dependent core rising, he points out that these factors are name and form on the one hand and consciousness on the other, and these two influence each other. Form is the form of the body, like you're sitting here right now with the form of the body, your sense of the body, how it feels from within. And that sense of form is made up of solidity, warmth, liquid sensations, and energy, movement, the four elements. And as for name, it's feeling and perception. Attention, intention, and contact. Consciousness, he says, lands on these things, and then things pr proliferate out of that. Now, in the element of name, the two most important factors are intention and attention. And other ways of describing dependent core rising draw out this importance. In some cases, you hear that prior to name and form, there's fabrication, sankhara. That's the intentional element, and it has intentions that are both physical and mental. Bodily fabrication is the breath, how you sense the breath, your immediate experience of the breath. And there's an inten intentional element there. Verbal fabrication is directed thought and evaluation. There's an intention there. Mental fabrication is feeling and perception. There's an intentional element there. So it's the intention that's important, and it plays itself out in feeling and perception and form. And then prior to fabrication is ignorance. It's, ignorance is not seeing things in the terms of the Four Noble Truths. In other words, inappropriate attention. When you look at things in the wrong way, you frame issues in the wrong way, then your fabrications are going to lead to suffering. All the other elements of name and form and consciousness are going to tend towards suffering and stress. But if you can change that way of attending to things, look at things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. In other words, where is the stress? What are you doing to cause it? Where is there freedom stress, and what kind of actions lead to that freedom? When you look in those terms, then the fabrications go in a different direction. 
name and form consciousness, all the rest of your experience goes in a different direction toward the end of suffering. That's the regularity of the Dharma. And although we tend to think of dependent core rising as being an extremely complex and abstruse teaching, and as the Buddha pointed out, it is complex. It's not easy. Still, it does give us guidance on how to approach each present moment, where to look, how to look. Because the other interesting thing about dependent core rising is all these factors come prior to sensory contact. Even before you see sights, listen to sounds, there's an intentional element already acting there. You have an agenda, what you're looking for, how you're going to look at things. You bring that to each present moment. So it's important to bring the right way of framing questions. Remember this as you practice. These are the important elements, intention and attention. Everything else springs from there. So when things come up in the present moment, how do you look at them? Try to look at them in terms of just stress and lack of stress. Try to put aside ideas of yourself or what lies outside of yourself. Put aside questions of what lies behind all of this. You just look at things as they're directly experienced. This is a mode of perception that's important to develop. There's another context where the Buddha calls this mode emptiness. In other words, seeing what's present, what's not present particularly in terms of what's present or not present in terms of stress or disturbance. That's where the big issue lies. And the duties that come from looking at these things in this way. If you see there's stress, you want to try to comprehend it. And due to that, you need to develop certain qualities of mind. That's the path. You need to put the mind in a position where it really can look at stress coming and going and not feel threatened by it, especially when the stress is really painful, really burdensome. Our normal reaction when we feel stress and strain is to identify, well, this is happening to me, and then when it's happened to you, there's a different set of imperatives. The imperative is to get rid of it. But if you can pull out that sense of me around it and simply look at it, what's happening right here, right now? from a position of well-being, the well-being that comes from right concentration, then the imperatives are different. The imperative is to understand the stress so you can see what's causing it, and then you can abandon the cause. So this is why we practice right concentration. You've got to put the mind in a good spot. Actually, when you're putting the mind in, a, in right concentration, you're putting yourself where the Buddha was when he discovered all these things. Once you're right here, and the mind is solidly still in the present moment, then you're looking at things from the same spot where the Buddha looked at them. And it's from this point of view you can see, well, this is the intention. This is the stress. This is the cause of stress. You can see them because you're looking at it from the right spot. Years back, I went on a camping trip, and we were hoping to go to Point Powell Point, which is the end of a plateau in Utah, ten thousand feet over ten thousand feet in elevation. The guidebook said that you could see a good third of the state of Utah from that spot. So we thought we were following the right directions, but we didn't end up at Powell Point. We ended up, in fact, at a place called Henderson Canyon. But we thought we were at Powell Point. The book said the book the road will end, and then from the place where the road ends, you have to walk out on a point. Well, we found a 
point that we could walk out to. From there you could look it out. And it's enough from here you can see this, that, and the other thing. So we thought we could say, well, this is that, and this is this, and this is the other thing. But then there was this huge plateau looming up to our east, and that wasn't mentioned in the book at all. It took a while to realize that that was Powell Point. We'd made the wrong turn someplace. We were not standing at the end of Powell Point, we were standing at something else. So the next day we made our way up to Powell Point, and then we saw what the guidebook was referring to, this, that, and the other thing. We're not the this, that, the other thing we thought we saw yesterday. We'd labeled things wrong. So if you want to understand what the Buddha is talking about, you've got to put yourself here, right at the present moment, where the mind is with the energy of the body. The mind is still. If there's going to be any directed thought and evaluation, it's related to the breath. Any feelings and perceptions are the feelings and perceptions of a mind really focused on the breath. And as the mind gets more and more still, those fabrications fall away, so that even direct thought and evaluation falls away. And finally, the movement of the breath falls away. You've just got still breath energy in the body. That's Powell Point. And from there you can see the Henry Mountains, you can see the Escalante region, you can see Bryce Canyon, the way they're described in the book. In other words, from this point you can see stress, and you're in a position where you can really comprehend it, because you don't feel so threatened by it. You don't have that other imperative, which is to get rid of it. The way you attend to things is the right way. You see things simply in terms of stress and its cause and the path leading to its ending and its ending. This is the knowledge you're supposed to bring into each present moment. This is the framework you bring into it. In other words, you see things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, and your intention is to perform the duties appropriate to each of these truths. That's the most skillful intention for the sake of putting it into suffering. So this is the regularity of the Dharma. Now, you may not be able to function in every moment in the absolute purity of purely appropriate attention, but you can get used to looking at things in terms of what is your intention right now and how you're looking at the events of your life. Do the narratives get in the way of your seeing things in terms of skillful and unskillful intentions, or do the narratives actually help? The way you approach each situation should be with this thought in mind. Where is the stress here? What can I do to at least minimize the stress? The harm, the disturbance, whatever is a burden for you or for the people around you. This way you come to each present moment armed with a knowledge of the regularity of the Dharma where you should focus your attention, what is the main priority right now, which is to keep on the path. So in this way the Buddha doesn't leave you high and dry. Because no matter what the situation, this is the way to look at it. in terms of the Four Noble Truths. And this is what you should try to do with it, try to comprehend the suffering, wherever the stress, suffering or stress is in that moment.
you may have other issues. And when, say when you're dealing with people, it's very different from sitting here with your eyes closed. But the basic framework can be the same. Once you've got this framework firmly in mind, then you can go wherever, wherever you want, deal with any situation. Because you're working from a framework that, instead of leading to more suffering and stress, actually starts, helps put them to an end. And that way, whatever the situation, you're on the path. It's this attitude, this one, the ability to keep all this in mind, that's mindfulness, and then the appropriate attention, and the right intention. That's what turns each moment into a moment of the practice. Regardless of the situation, So this is how all that complexity of dependent core arising actually gives you tools for the present moment. Tools that you can use for the sake of your own well-being and, and the well-being of all the people around you. Each moment may be new, but it follows a pattern. So always keep that pattern in mind. 